Um, sweet, cool. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about Unity 5. Um, show a lot of, I don't like presentation slides, so it's going to be lots of hands on how to do bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to cover sort of a whole range of topics and yeah, uh, mostly Unity 5 stuff. So yeah, uh, talk about physical based shading. Um, so basically how you can make objects actually look and feel like they're supposed to feel, like make rock feel like a rock and stuff like that. Uh, reflection probes, uh, draw core debugger. So these are only sort of five topics, because if I was to do a full long presentation on every single bit Unity 5 has, we'd, it would pretty much be assembly for four days. And uh, we'd all be very tired, as you all probably are. So um, every time I do a talk, I like to find out more about you guys. So um, put your hand up if you're a programmer. OK, so you're all awake. This is a good test. Most of you, uh, put your hand if you stayed up all night playing Hearthstone. Right, OK, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, Counter-Strike? Anyone stay up all night? Wow, OK, you have a lot of constraint. Sweet. Um, put your hand if you're an artist, like 3D artist. OK, cool. Uh, 2D artist? Uh, UI artist? OK, cool. Uh, audio designer? You don't have a beard. Audio guys have beards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, put your hand if you uh, use Unity. OK, pretty cool. Put your hand out if you have no idea what Unity is. No, you just saw a big group of people all sit here and thought, this might be fun. All right, OK, sweet. Put your hand out if you're from Finland. Kitos. No, uh, Moi. Yeah, <laughs> so I got that wrong. Cool. Uh, sweet. So um, yeah, uh, like the introduction, my name's Andy. Um, I work for Unity. Uh, that's how I do my hair in the morning jump out of a plane. Um, so basically, I'm part of the evangelism team. So I work with the developers, get new features, get new products, and things like that. Then demonstrate them, go to the game studios, come to events like this, basically put it in front of people and see how they respond, whether they like certain things, whether they don't like certain things, how they're going to use these things. And then I take that advice, uh, take that feedback and things, go to our developers, and so that we can kind of like develop the product in, in line with what you guys are after and how you're going to use it. So um, I'm on Twitter, just like everyone is. I also have an email, andyt at unity3d.com. Uh, yeah, so if you send me an email, if you're making a pretty cool game or you're planning on making a game, you're not too sure how the new systems work or how the existing systems work, just send me an email. Or if you want to talk about Game of Thrones um, or Breaking Bad or play Dark Souls or Hearthstone, you know, all these different things. Uh, sweet. So yeah, let's get on with it. So uh, Unity 4 has had a, like, quite a long cycle. Lots of things have been introduced. Um, Bearing to Flash, ha, right? Uh, Building to Windows 8, phone, GUI system eventually. Um, unfortunately, this talk won't be about the new UI system because it's uh, a full talk in itself. We already have lots of content online. Um, this talk's going to be more hands-on of sort of bits and pieces that we don't necessarily have so much hands-on stuff online. Or my voice has dropped. Oh, OK, cool. Sweet. OK. He's looking very puzzled, which isn't a good sign. I have no idea what happened. And I didn't touch anything. I just touched All right, OK. Sweet. Right, OK. So um, every cycle, we go through sort of upgrading Unity. And this way, we can kind of like give a lot of the old things a lick of new paint, kind of like rejig a, lo um, a load of sort of older features and things, and kind of like go back, redesign them, re-implement, and things like this. So Unity 5 in the release, we're focusing on a lot of quite um, managing your assets and kind of the way you present your game, so the presentation. So we've redone the rendering system, lighting, audio, uh, probably uh, 2D and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's obviously the new UI system coming out soon this summer um, at some stage. And we've got lots of content online. But I'm going to talk about Unity 5 things. And if I go back, and talk about these five things exactly in the next 40 minutes. So the first thing is uh, physical base shading. Put your hand out if you have any idea what that is. OK, some of you. Cool. There's actually a talk straight after this about physical base shading. So it would have been handy if they were swapped around. So um, the way that Unity is making an approach to physical base shading is to rather than supply you with materials to make everything look like shiny metallic stuff, it's actually designing and creating a shader called the, it's called the standard shader now, but it used to be called the uber shader. So I'm going to call it that because it sounds cooler. Um, it's basically creating a shader that allows you to kind of 
add it to your objects and sculpt it in a way that it looks like the object. So for example, here is a Viking village scene, which our uh, content team are working on. And everything in that scene except the skybox is using the same shader. So the mud is using the same shader as the wood, as the thatch roof, as like the, there's like little metal shields that are reflective and stuff like that. It's all using the same shader out of the box. And it's very easy to swap and change. So I'm going to eventually bring up a cat and make the cat look like a rock, then leather, then like yarn, and then metal, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, which sounds very ambitious. Um, so obviously we have this doll demo. It's called, well, it's, it's changed, it was the Uber shader, then the universal shader, now the standard shader, but Uber sounds better, so I'll call it that. So um, we have here the doll. Um, my girlfriend jokes that I see this doll more than I see her. So uh, yeah, she hasn't got a name. Um, and everything on the doll, all the different elements, that's really, really dark. OK, Is this, can the screen be brightened up a little bit? or? No, he's too scared to touch anything, so it'll break everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, let's have a look here. So for example, everything on the doll, um, is, if you see up closely, it's quite difficult here, is using exactly the same shader. Like the cloth is using the same shader as, for example, the ceramic face. Uh, the ceramic face is even kind of like reflective as well. Um, we even have like the, um, this bit in the background. So this illuminated bit in the background here and the metal around here is all using the same shader. So basically, the standard shader out of the box allows you to kind of like bring in your object, and then set it all up. So rather than sort of mucking around with the doll and uh, playing around with her, as my girlfriend jokes about, um, I'm going to do it on this cat instead. So currently here, I have a very silly, very standard cat. And the cat is just sitting there like so. So if you look very closely, the cat will have a diffuse shader. So when you import an object normally into Unity, it just gives it a standard diffuse shader with just a texture slot. So um, the artist has created his sexy, beautiful art with normal maps and all this stuff. And then he just gets this big list of like, right, OK, so what do I use? What's the difference between diffuse, diffuse detail, and diffuse fast? OK, OK, so let's go bump diffuse. Right, so I can pass in a texture and a normal map. But uh, what if I want it to be kind of shiny? So then I have to go to here and uh, bump specular. That's great, but we're finding it to be transparent as well as shiny, as well as reflective, as well as have normal maps. And you know, which shader is that? Oh, I have to write one? Oh, OK, whatever. So what we have here in Unity 5 is uh, we still support all the old legacy shaders, um, but we've kind of like are going to be focusing on making shaders for specific cases. So I'm going to use the standard. I'm going to rename that Uber. I'm going to get it into trunk somehow. So that is now the standard shader. So we have here the cat using the standard shader in the game, the physically based shader. So what I have here is the cat is still very, very boring. So let's do something with this. So the way that the standard shader is built up is it has many, many slots for different use cases. So in this case, it just has a texture slot. It also has a specular, normal map, height map, occlusion, emission, detail mask. And it also has a secondary maps, which I'll play around with a bit later. And by default, everything with the standard shader has a specularity to it or a smoothness. So currently, the smoothness is zero. So it could be, for example, like uh, clothes. Clothes aren't very shiny. However, if I turn up the slider, you can actually see on top of the cat, it's actually reflecting the things sort of in the scene. It's using reflection. So now the cat kind of has like a shininess and reflectiveness to it. And this is kind of out of the box. Um, and the way this has been intended to use is the standard shader is for, like, uh, I guess, like 85% of use cases of static objects. So if you think, for example, this floor here has some element of shininess, maybe not too much. I have some element of shininess. This bottle is going to be shinier than I am, so it's more reflective. It's kind of like all these use cases. Obviously, if you wanted to do like Team Fortress 2 style sail shaded or Left 4 Dead outline, you, you might need to write your own shader. But this is for like 89% of uses, which is a pretty good percentage. So we've got this standard specular slider here. Also, with the specular slider, is you can then set the color of the specular. So I can then make this kind of like have a red specularity. I can make it go white completely. So it's like my cat is now a mirror, I guess, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, and let's change it there. So obviously, you have lots of slots here. So for example, um, in my project folder, I've got a normal map, an occlusion map, and a specular map. So what I can do here is I can then pass in my normal map onto my object. And my cat is now kind of like a balloon. And as well as having this normal map, the developers have decided that as well as applying the normal map onto your object, you can then actually change that normal map. So you don't have to go back into Photoshop and then do some stuff here. You can actually just move this slider. So I can say, if it has zero normal, 
it's uh, fine. I can then actually like pull it up so the cat is getting more. That's the cat hung over after drinking all night, or he stayed up all night playing, drinking Red Bull and uh, playing Hearthstone. Uh, Alex is nodding. <laughs> or he's still waking up. So you can actually take this normal map and say, oh, we want it to go positive or negative, and actually he's eating a lemon. He's been in the sauna too long, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys got that joke. Cool. Oh, I know your sauna stuff. Um, so currently here we have a normal map and a specular map. So as well as having the specular, which applies to basically the whole object, you can actually bring in your own custom specular map. So here I have a specular map, which is basically just sort of makes sort of areas go shiny. So if I go to my cat and I apply my specular map, he's going to be way more shiny because it's basically making a map that's basically dependent on the areas. So for example, his eye in the specular map hasn't been included, whereas his other bits of his body are, have. So yeah, a um, couple more things. So his ear isn't too dark here, so I can also apply a occlusion map. So my artist has been very kind and has drawn an occlusion map. So if I add that occlusion map in, he's then got sort of dark bits there. And I can play around with this. It's kind of like you're kind of sculpting the object. You can also define the, the occlusionness. So for example, here you can see his eyes and kind of, as well as adding the textures on, you can then play around with how they affect the material. So some of you who, put your hand up if you're like the optimization guy in the team and everyone leaves it to you to optimize your game. No one here. Wow, okay. So some of you are probably having a miniature heart attack that there's lots of open slots here. Is anyone? Okay, there's one dude. Okay, so the way that the standard shader works is it a pay-as-you-go system. So when it on builds um, and on its use, it basically says no height map, exclude that, emission map, nope, exclude that, detail mask, nope, exclude that, and it kind of takes these four textures and bundles them into one draw call. So it's rather than it saying, render the texture, then specular, then normal, then height map, then occlusion, then emission, then detail mask, then these other ones, it's actually just bundling it into one, squashing it like a sandwich and then passing off to the renderer. So yeah, it's uh, super kick-ass. And it works on mobile and all across the board. So I'm happy with this, it looks like a balloon, but I want to make my cat I want to basically deform my cat even more. So I'm going to take off a lot of his different elements, and I'm going to look at, uh, and let's sort of scale him back so he's just a big, standard, stupid cat. So I'm going to look here at the secondary map section. So the secondary map section, so the first section is sort of intended to apply your textures, so how your character looks, and basically the different details. So for example, our t-shirt has unity in here, that would be like, you know, part of the main map. The second map is how your object feels. So is it cracked, or does it have like, is it cut out like bits of cheese, or like with cheese bubbles, or is it made of wool? So you have here, you can pass in a, t a texture which overlays the first one, and you can pass in a normal map as well. So I've got my cat here, and I've got a range of textures that I can apply to him. So if you look down here, I've got a cracked texture, leather, noise, pattern, rock, silk, sleeve. These are just ones that come with this project. You can, I've, I've got wool textures as well, so I'm gonna make the cat look like it's made out of wool. Um, yeah, so first one, person to shout out one of these, I'll do it first. Someone shout out one of these, please. I had blur. Um, leather, cool. Most people go noise, which is the most boring one. So leather, leather's the most fun one, thank you. Um, so here, underneath the leather, leather, I've got a texture for uh, just leather, and I've got one for the normal map as well. So if I go to my cat, I can go apply the texture on, cool, apply the normal map on, and then I can sort of change the scale at tiling, so let's go 10 and 10. And then also I can play around normal map, so I can basically say, become more leathery. So my cat is kind of like a leathery type cat. As well as leather, uh, let's do, my favorite one is wool. Um, I can also take out the texture, so if I get rid of the texture, I can basically sculpt it. I can make it look like a leathery balloon. So then I can basically like, yeah, and then the specular map as well. So it's like a shiny, leathery, reflective balloon, and it, God, he looks really, really zoned out. I feel sorry for him. Okay. Poor cat, yeah. Cool, so um, as well as leather, uh, let's do wool. Let's make him look like he's made out of wool. Uh, okay. Whoa, okay, that's a little too much wool. So yeah, my cat now feels like I just want to give him a cuddle after him being really hungover. Um, I can then increase the shininess, so he's kind of like 
I guess, shiny wool. Um, yeah, okay, let's do one more. Uh, let's get rid of that. Okay, someone pick a different one. Not leather and not wool. Rock, yes, that's a cool one. Sleeve pattern's pretty, oh, okay, I'll do sleeve pattern as well. So, rock, so I'm gonna apply a rocky-like texture. Now, rock isn't that shiny, so I can obviously play around the slider and kind of like tone it down a little bit. And rock is kind of brown, so I can then set the, um, set the specularness. Uh, okay, let's lower it down a little bit. Um, so this rock isn't really bumped, so if I apply that rock normal map onto it, and it sort of increased it, it looks really crumbly and yeah, it looks like kind of like a yeah crumbly rock planet. Yeah, so yeah, my cat, I really feel sorry for him. And the last one I'm gonna do is sleeve pattern. So currently you don't just have to apply in like a really standard sort of basic test like that. It also takes colors. So if I want my cat to look like he's part of the curtains, for example, I could then select my cat. Uh, let's curtains aren't reflective. So let's drop that down uh, and then apply like a sleeve pattern onto him. So my cat has kind of got like a floral pattern on top of his first texture, and then apply the normal map. Whoa. So yeah, my cat, uh, he looks really, yeah, I really feel sorry for him right now. So yeah, you can kind of use a standard shader to sculpt this object. Um, on the doll, for example, the doll's got cloth, um, the rock floor and the wooden texture on the bottom. Okay, that's C3 down there, but like the wooden box on, uh, wooden texture on the bottom, is uh, using the stain shader. So this rock looks all cracked, and this same shiny shader here looks all cracked as well. Uh, sweet, right, okay, I've got 100 other things to talk about. Okay, so another thing that we've sort of overhauled is kind of like the background rendering of the scene. So I hear a lot, of, I see a lot of uh, Unity games, um, and a lot of them, people come say to me and say, my game looks blue, why does everything in my game look blue? This is silly. So we kind of uh, analyze that. It's like, why do people find their games are blue? And it's part of the whole scene render settings. So what I can do is there's a new panel. So if you go to edit, scene render settings, you now have a lot more options for the whole environment. So you're basically applying texture to the whole environment. So here I've got a skybox. Um, I can set the ambient mode. So I can say, go to the ambient mode of all my objects. And I can basically set either a single flat color so everything in my scene has kind of got a red tint, which is kind of what's standard in Unity at the moment. I could also set a hemisphere, so I could set everything at the top of my object is kind of like light blue, and everything on the bottom of my object is like green and things like that, spooky. Um, I can also set like have three in between, or what I can do is I can actually use the color scheme from the skybox, as you see here, and kind of apply that to everything in the scene. So if you have an outdoor scene, You've probably seen skyboxes, and then the actual objects in the scene don't look the same. You can kind of replicate the colors of the skybox, and it would then apply it. Uh, and you can create a light. So you can set how much skybox exposure there is. So if you want to use your own lighting, you don't have to use it. Or you can use whatever's lighting is in the skybox. So um, our developers, what they've done is they've made a uh, thing in the editor where what you can do is this is just, swap, this is just going to uh, scene render settings and just swapping out this skybox material. It's just going through and swapping out. So for example, if it's the forest, it's gonna look all green. Uh, waterfall, sort of light, everything's quite a bit lighter. Um, if it's the light here. And one thing you'll notice is that in the skybox in the background here, that sort of, it's detecting where the brightest light source is, so where a light bulb is or where the sun is. So what you'll notice is that on this side of the, the cat, it's very quite dark. On this side, it's a lot, on his butt, it's quite a lot lighter. And for example, here on the key, it's a lot brighter as well, so. I've got this key like that. So if I swatch through, you'll see on this lake, it's going through, and it's also reflecting all the different elements. It's reflecting the skybox around the outside. Pretty cool. Um, okay, so someone's about to point something out very, very obvious. What if you have an indoor scene? Was anyone gonna say that, or? Okay, so obviously this is great if you have an outdoor scene, you have a big game like Dark Souls, and you're outside, and you're reflecting everything using the light. But what if it's an indoor scene? What if you have a narrow corridor and then what you want to do is you want to perhaps not use the lighting, but perhaps make a uh, reflection. Instead of reflecting the skybox, reflect the room to set up a probe in the room. Thankfully, our developers have done that. So for example, uh, you can go to the top here, go to game object, create general, and here we have a reflection probe. So what this is going to do, it's going to place a probe at a location in the game, and it's going to create kind of like a mirrored reflection of that point. 
So you can place it on like a character's shield. So as he walks past flames, it reflects off the flames. You can place it in a whole room and bake the whole room. So if I set up a reflection probe, which is here, what you can see is in the reflection probe, I've got the cat's kind of butt, and I've got like the, uh, the character here. Um, I can set up the different resolutions. So I could say, oh, my game to basically look uh, and bake it. Oh, my game to basically look like it's, uh, well, any indie game these days. Uh, or Fez 2, before it was cancelled. Um, I could bake it as like 512, which basically makes it look a lot nicer. Okay, so this is currently an alpha build Unity 5, so if there's any creaky stuff, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, but it looks pretty sexy. So you can use it on like a mirror. It's basically reflecting everything all around the outside edge. So this scene is quite a bad example for reflecting, so let's go to an indoor scene. Open project. Which one was it? This one. Uh, nah. Sorry, cat. Right, OK, so I have here a demo project. And it's all set indoors. So you have lots of these different, that's really difficult to say. You have lots of different segmented rooms. So when I play my game, I've basically got, um, I've got my objects all in here. I've got the reflectiveness. I can see it on my screen, but yeah, I've, I can go over here. There's like a head. There's reflectiveness all out here. This isn't even using the new enlightened system yet. So this is just the standard lights that are already in Unity, and with all, everything has been standard shaded. So for example, here, this emission sort of like this table here has got the shader on. And you'll notice that there's kind of a reflection inside this room as I walk around. Um, I've also got a really, really shiny kitchen somewhere, which is not what my kitchen looks like at all, much to my girlfriend's annoyance. So here I've got the kind of reflections all happening. It looks much better on my screen. Um, so what I can do is I can go into my edit scene render settings, and rather than using a skybox, I can then change, for example, all my ambient color, so I can actually tone this up. So I can actually tone up all the different lighting in the scene, so all the ambient lighting. So here, OK, that's a lot nicer. Cool. So I can walk around here. I've basically got here all the shininess. And what you'll notice is as I walk back and forth, it's reflecting sort of like the ceiling on the floor in, in, the different, in the room. And the way it's doing that is it's basically different nodes at different positions. So for example, if I go to this room here, I've got a reflection probe in the middle of this room. That's a bug, right? That's not supposed to do it, OK? Teething problems, OK? So um, here, it's got, here it's got a reflection probe. Uh, baking this room, and what it's doing is it's applying inside this room. If anything has a mesh render on it, so for example this object here, it's saying, do you want to use the reflection probe at all? By default it will go yes, but if I didn't want this object to reflect it, I wouldn't have to. And because it's baking the reflection probe, you can actually see the reflection probe inside. It's actually saved to a cube map that you can then, for example, take into Photoshop and then recolor it or rejig different areas of it. Um, and I can have it here, and I can set all sorts of things. So if I don't want it as shiny as this, I could, for example, change it to be like a specular probe. So whoop, don't do that. Apply. So it's going to be kind of a bit more faded. Yeah. Come afterwards to the booth, and I'll show it all on the screen, so it looks kick-ass. Um, so rather than it being such a pure light, it's actually a reflective one there. And this will work on mobile. I've then got you know, a reflection probe on here to reflect kind of the light. Um, this head, which I can walk through, that's not intentional. That's fine. Um, I've got this head, and this is kind of like having shading all around here. And I've got this scene all around here. So basically, yeah, the, uh, the reflection probes, you can place it within rooms and bake all the little rooms. Sweet. Right, I've got through two things in about half the time. Uh, what else do I have to talk about? Right, OK, so physical probe shading, reflection probes, draw call debugger. OK, so that's currently the reflection probes. They are working on them more. Um, the reflection probes will work on you know, all the platforms we support. It'll work on mobile, it'll work on uh, console. It'll basically work all out of the box. Uh, when Enlighten comes in, or when I'll be able to demo Enlighten, the global illumination uh, that we've licensed from Geometrics, it'll basically just add more lighting. This is all just the standard lights that basically uh, are using Unity app. You, know, you can currently use in Unity 3 on uh, version 4. So another thing that um, I've often have a problem with, and some of you guys are going to put your hands up, is you notice here I've got an insane amount of draw calls. I didn't make this scene, by the way. Um, so who, who's looked at this draw call number and thought, what is this actually drawing? Please put your hands up. 
Okay, so you look at this and you're thinking that's 1,454 calls to the, to the renderer to render all these objects, render all the lighting, all the shadows, all the materials, all the particles, all the terrain, all these different bits and pieces. So what our developers did is they decided to visualize this so you actually have a step-by-step -step so you can view each individual draw call. So if you go to Window, uh, Frame Debugger, what you can do is you can position this on the side of your game view or position it wherever you want. What you'll notice is that I can then have a list of all of my draw calls in my scene, and I can actually step through them and actually view it actually building up all the different objects. So let's go to one bit further on the room. This is a really unoptimized scene, which is actually pretty good. OK, that's doing all the drawing there. That's doing all the drawing there. Hang on. I think it's towards the end it gets. OK. So it's actually building up all the different uh, Fraction probe stuff. You can actually like scrub through with this like scroll bar here. Basically, like view all the different, so you can then sort of see it slowly build up. So it's rendering all those things in the background there before it even renders my stuff here. So I'll probably have to put some culling in. It's not like a perfect uh, silver bullet telling you your game doesn't run on a you know an iPhone three because of this 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 reasons. It's more like a way so you can say. Uh, I've been a bit of an idiot. I should probably need to like turn that section off or like occlusion color or something. Um, I only want to view these things here. So it draws all the meshes, and then it does all sort of the lighting bits and pieces, uh, and then in the end, it then does all the post-processing effects and stuff like that. And they even show you what's actually being rendered on this call. So for example, here I have a visualization of the material being rendered, uh, the mesh being rendered. You even have like uh, a list of all the different. Hang on. You can have a list of all the different sort of vertices and indices. You can also set, you know, the different colors. Uh, you can also output it to a spreadsheet if you want to. That's sort of being worked on. Um, and you can also do it in game. So, for example, uh, if I if I walked over here and I said, right, okay, let's go over here. Now this head is uh, how many draw calls is that head using? Is it using one for the light, using one for the shadows, and things like that? I can actually hang on. <laughs> Pause it at that particular point, enable the draw call, and it's then going to use the draw call system for basically that exact point. So I can then say, OK, cool, let's find the head. Which is here. OK, that's tiny. <laughs> yeah, OK, that's not even the head. OK, so it's still being worked on. But it's just a way that you can visualize all your draw calls. And it will use anything that's being rendered in Unity, it will use. So all the new UI system, you can see how complex it is, all the 2D, shadows, uh, post-processing, basically everything, which is pretty sweet. Right, OK, so export to WebGL. So um, another thing in Unity is, uh, that's we've been working on sort of for a year is kind of like where you know the web is going to go. So currently we have the web player, which has something like 400 million installs. I think 200 million of which are in China, um, and that's very nice. But obviously, if I want to make a game and send it to my nan, um, she obviously would need to install the player. People don't want to install things because they think installing things means viruses and you know all this problem. So about a year ago, our developers decided to look into WebGL. And about a year ago, all the browsers, the only things WebGL were really useful were kind of like very still objects that you could maybe rotate and things like that. And there's been a lot of hops recently um, from all the major browser providers. I mean, Microsoft supported WebGL, I think, before so Apple, which is Microsoft supporting before anyone was pretty impressive. Sorry if you work for Microsoft. I like you guys, really. Um, so yeah, so what we decided to do is work on a WebGL builder. So it'll work in parallel with our web player. So our web player will still be able to build. Uh, WebGL will be able to build. And eventually, our WebGL player will kind of like almost overtake it. But that depends on you know, the browser's performance. Um, currently, the WebGL stuff works best in, Mo in uh, Firefox, simply because Mozilla came to our offices and helped us do it. Um, Obviously, all the other providers, like Google and Apple and Microsoft and things like that, are all helping out. But Mozilla seems to help the most, which is interesting. So yeah. Um, and basically, yeah, you can basically just create your game like you normally would. You don't need to make a special you know, WebGL-specific build. You can just build your game. I can build it to iOS, then build to WebGL. And I'll both have those two platforms. And the way the WebGL building works is you have your Unity bundle. You then go to native C++. And then you go from native C++ to Inscripten, then to JavaScript. Yeah, our developers they said that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, the first WebGL build pumped out a JavaScript file of 1.2 gig. 
no, here's a web developer. Oh, yeah, you're looking cringy. But they had it. They had a cube spinning with 1.2 gig. Yeah, it's great. And what they're doing is because we're working closely with Mozilla and things like that, they're coming in. They're saying, oh, we've managed to cut out an extra 100 meg from the audio. We managed to trim it down to, I think their target's you know, going to be under 10 meg somehow. Um, and currently, I think it's about 20, uh, 30 or so. Um, but yeah, they're constantly working on it, and it looks pretty awesome. So the, what it actually exports is it exports your HTML page, where it renders all the content onto, a file loader, so you could customize kind of like the loading bar. Um, you have all your HTML resources. And output.js is your whole game. However, it's all encrypted, so you can't go in there and steal someone's assets. So if I run this in Firefox, I've got the four-year-old demo project of Angry Bots. Uh, I could send this to my grandma, and she can play this right now if she wanted to. Um, she's more of a Candy Crush person, though, so I tried to disown her. Um, I can walk around here. And basically, this is just all using the standard out-of-the-box things with Unity. You just build it. You don't have to prepare your build. It's got reflections. It's got custom shaders. It's got robots that you have to kill. Yeah. Um, what you also notice is that in this canvas that's being rendered, you can actually have calls. So this is a separate button in the HTML page to your game. So you can actually say on your page, click a button, it will do something in your game. In this case, the button makes the canvas go full screen. I allow it. So now I can play my game. This, I could run this, you know, like fine, not need a plugin, not need to download anything, which is cool. So if I leave that, um, if you actually look at the source code, uh, because some people say that is all trickery, that is black magic, that there's no way that is all uh, WebGL JavaScript. You can see here, it's got the JavaScript element. It's applying the Mozilla stuff, the WebKit stuff, the Microsoft stuff. Um, is, you can look at all this, this, this demo project's online. I've actually challenged people. They say, well, if I release a game, I can just go in there and just steal this character. And I've challenged people to go through and steal it from the source, and they can't. So yeah. And this output.javascript. I challenged them on the forums, and no one came back with a positive thing. Um, so this is just your whole game, but it's all complete and utter gibberish. So if you're scared that someone's going to rip off your game, uh, trust me, you can't like, steal anything. There. If you do, um, come talk to us. Yeah, but I don't think you can. Um, so that's great. We have a four-year-old, five-year-old demo um, running. So what we did is we went to some of our friends who make iOS games and mobile games, for in this case, um, Madfinger, who make Dead Trigger. Um, which is like a, 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 a zombie shooting game. So they decided to take their iOS build. They rejigged it a couple of, like with this menu. So I to take this iOS build and uh, break this. So who, which level shall I choose, left or right? Right, right is the better one, so I was, I was going to pick that one. Um, so there's actually a call from inside the canvas of your game to your browser as well. So you can kind of send it both ways. So here, you've even left up the iOS buttons. Um, which is quite impressive. I can run around. We've got J.J. Abrams lens flare, if you, uh, or Star Wars, soon to be Star Wars lens flare, if you're into that sort of thing. I've then got violence. Um, I don't like, yeah. Now, I, obviously, you can't touch the screen and change this, because this isn't touch screen. But this will run on like an Android device, for example, uh, much to Google's disapproval. Um, also, uh, I think we're probably the only company that, if you push two, I think, you place a chicken. And this is our demo. This is, this is the next generation of video gaming on the web. Uh, I think that's Madfinger actually decided to do that. But these chickens are actually pretty, pretty useful. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, cool. Yeah, so that's an iOS game that they've just built. Uh, there's clothes. Yeah, cool. And that's all in WebGL. Sweet. I would do a build, but currently the builds, because they're kind of then they're making it work and then kind of optimizing it post. I would build this, but it would take a little while. It would get there in the end, and I don't want to stand up on stage twiddling my thumbs looking like an idiot. Um, yeah. OK, so I think I had one more thing. How much time do I have? Someone said five, someone said 10. OK, cool. Um, so as well as all the 3D stuff, which is very nice and very lovely, um, we're also continuing our support for 2D stuff. So rather than just people releasing 2D, and we release 2D and say, hey, look at 2D. It's nice. It's pretty. Um, our developers have kind of looked at the feedback and the way people are using 2D and kind of re-implementing that. So uh, what they decided to do is they decided to, to no, let's not save it. Uh, they decided to kind of work on sort of different bits and pieces with 2D to kind of make it 
uh, a lot better out of the box. So in this case, if we go to Component Physics 2D, we'll have the options of things like Area Effector. So that's basically a grid area that if your character goes into, you can push them in a certain direction, like wind go up or left or right, or like a booster pad. So you can make a top-down racing game. Uh, point effector. So this basically is kind of like at this exact location, attract objects or repel objects from this point. We show this to Rovio and they said, great, everyone's going to make Angry Birds space now. Um, it's going to be the next Flappy Bird. Uh, platform effector. So you can basically have a platform. So like Mega Man style, like conveyor belt. So say push objects in a direction. Um, surface effector. Uh, they're still working on that. Um, so what you'll notice here is we have a series of uh, 2D sort of areas. Uh, we have a collider, which is a trigger, and we can define if this use, it use, uses an effect or not. And what you can see here is we can say, when our object goes into it, push it in the force magnitude of 5. So I looked at this and I was like, yeah, but which direction does that mean? I think they are going to rejig it so you push it in which axis, but they'll probably need to work on that bit. So what you'll notice is that we have an area that's pushing it this way, an area that's pushing it down, left and right. And if I run this demo, um, the coin will come, it will bounce, it will come and bounce, it will explode into many coins. And basically, the area is just pushing the coins in that particular direction. I could do something uh, wild, so I could select all the coins and just duplicate them many times. So all the coins are being pushed, which is pretty cool. So you can have top-down racing games and have drifts and things like that. Uh, the attracts, uh, don't save. So here we have three planetoids, or different areas, and they're kind of like pulling objects within their path. So when objects come within a ring that's about, uh, about this sort of this big, it's basically attracting the objects to that location. So you could have like cut the rope style, like gravity physics and things like that. As well as attracting them, you can repel them as well. So I'm going to go to, uh, let's go to the top right one. So what you notice here is underneath the planetoid, uh, I'm going to go to the gravity effector. And what you notice here is it's saying force magnitude of minus 10. So it's basically pulling everything in. So someone pick a different number that's positive. Five, so 50, come on. <laughs> so now it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, nope, you're not coming here. Hang on. Yeah, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> OK, I'll do five because the guy's going to post on Twitter, he didn't do five. I'm really upset. Five, OK, let's see what it does. I reckon it will just push it slightly. Yeah, it's saying. It only affects the big rocks as well. So you can basically kind of like make points move to different locations. So my goal is going to make like Super Mario Galaxy, but in 2D, and try and not get sued by Nintendo. Uh, as well as doing that, you can reference this by code and kind of do an attract or repel. So currently here, I have a, a magnet. And when I click it, it will attract objects underneath this particular range to this point. When I click it, it will basically repel it as well. So I have objects that are flying around. Currently, it's repelling it in that curve. So I'm saying go here. If I click it, I can then attract points. Hang on. Oh, it's pulling it way too fast. But then if I click it, I can then fire it. So attract points and then fire it as well. So you can kind of access that bits all there. Uh, you know, what else is there? Yeah, I think I've actually covered everything I wanted to talk about. I know I've done it very quickly and very brief. Um, I've got like five minutes left, I think. Yep, OK, cool. I've got five minutes left. So um, yeah, I've covered everything I wanted to talk about. Um, we've got a whole range of stuff. So what you can see is we're actually kind of like overhauling and updating a lot of, sort of background bits and pieces. So new rendering features. So obviously, we've seen render settings, probes, things like that. New lighting systems, the new lighting systems using um, Geometrics and Lighten, which is used on like Mirror's Edge and EA licensed it for like Battlefield and stuff like that. So we've kind of licensed it and just put it in Unity for you guys to use. So it's going to be pretty kick ass. Um, new audio mixer, so basically you'll be able to mix and blend different audio and things like that. Uh, draw call debugger, show 2D physics. Animator additions. So what you can do is you can then put like on entry and put scripts on exact transitions and exact nodes of an animation system, which is pretty cool. WebGL, new GUI system, eventually, um, cloud support, and things like that. And that's just the 5 very release. So if you think Unity 4 is you know, all 2D tools, animation, Windows, stuff like that, the 5 release alone is as big as the whole of Unity 4, which is pretty cool. 
in the future, we're also going to be focusing on um, a lot of other things. So, for example, working on a whole brand new networking solution, new inputs, new kind of going all to those old, old things that are very old and jaded and kind of like giving them a massive lick of paint. So in terms of the networking, um, rather than it being made by people who genuinely know networking a bit, we've actually hired people who work on like engine drives for like World of Warcraft, League of Legends, which you guys should know. Yeah, you're, yeah, ish, yeah. Um, people like that. So um, to actually make our networking solution, which is pretty cool. Um, and yes, groovy. And that's pretty much it. Uh, the new GUI system is out in summer. Um, Unity 5 is uh, sort of, it's still in development, but it should be out when it's ready. Um, so when it's polished up and when it's beautiful enough and you can build beautiful, sexy stuff like this to an iPhone 4, which is, yeah, really, really old device, which is sweet. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I post sort of links to cool Unity games and things like that. Um, I have email, so send me sort of questions about your games or uh, if you have any cool games, I like playing them as well. So send them to me, I'll test them out and things like that. And yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, hang on a sec. Yeah, a uh, question about that web graphics library. Uh, I'm just wondering, will there be support for CUDA and OpenGL at what, what point? since it looks really, really promising way to make games for online players and it's, uh, those not so good um, laptops, but which have a decent graphics card installed. Um, so your question... Hardware. Hardware? Yeah, which... What kind of uh, graphics card will be supported? On WebGL? Whip. Yeah. Um, all of them. We're trying to, so currently it will like, the current WebGL build, uh, we put it out there and we basically saw a lot of, we put it on our blog so you can play that mad, that dead trigger shoot zombies type thing and you can also play the, uh, the angry bots. And what we did is we put that out there and then we sort of saw user analytics and kind of see, you know, what people were accessing on, what pe if it didn't run on certain browsers and things like that, and graphics cards. So uh, uh, we're aiming for as low as possible because we don't like to say only people with this nice, you know, thousand dollar machine can run something that's embedded in a website. That's, that's madness. So we like to sort of target everyone across the board. That's sort of our goal. Um, I guess the best way to check is to get your mum's laptop and try running it and then invite your mum to test it out for us if you want. Um, yeah, I don't really have a defined answer for that, but we're, we're aiming for as many people as possible, and we're working closely with all the browser providers like Mozilla to make it as much as possible. I don't think IE6, though, um, but then nothing runs on that. Cool. Has anyone got any... Hello. Uh, all right. Hi. Um, I'm a programmer, a professional web developer, and um, I haven't done anything with Unity, but I've done a lot of game programming, like in the evenings and so. Uh, my question is that if I want to get into Unity, what's the easiest way to get started to actually build something? Okay. Um, so on our official website, oh, well, thankfully Unity has lots of uh, people who make lots of step-by-step -step tutorials. Yeah. So it depends how you want to learn. So I personally don't like to sit down and watch a 10 hour long video just for like five minutes at the end of something I wanted to know. So what our learn team have done um, in the company is they've either they've created little bite sized five minute, 10 minute segments on a particular topic. Yeah. So if you're a programmer, you probably don't need to know what a, this is a function, this is a variable type right. stuff. But you might be interested in how the audio system works. So you can go off and watch those bite sized audio things. We also do have start to finish games, like, like a stealth game and a rollerball game and a spaceship shooter game made by our um, tutorial team. But also we have a lot of people like Quill18 does a lot of tutorials like, and people done make Minecraft in a day. And uh, yeah, lots of, lots of things like that. Um, if, you give me a, if you send me an email, I can send you like a list of loads of like yeah. different sites and sure. lots of information and things. All right, thanks. No worries. Um, I think we're being kicked out soon for the PBR one more? Um, either. <laughs> uh, 
uh, when uh, will the 2D physics engine finally catch up to the 3D physics engine? Um, so the 2D physics engine is separate from the 3D one. So the 3D one is using NVIDIA's like PhysX 3D library. So our developers, when they started with the 2D stuff, they said, we could be incredibly lazy and just use the 3D physics engine for the 2D stuff. But that's quite overkill, especially on some mobile games when, which you want to target low platforms. And you're know, using a 3D physics engine to calculate 2D. That doesn't make sense. So what they've done is they're integrating native box 2D. So it's actually a separate physics engine entirely. So it's 3D and 2D. Um, and rather than running at the same point, what it does is it kind of like says, if you're only using 2D physics in your game, so you only have 2D physics objects, it'll only build, it'll only like basically calculate 2D physics in your game. It'll sort of exclude the 3D stuff and vice versa. Um, so in terms of catching up to it, it's an entirely different physics engine together. So what do you mean by catching up to it? Uh, there are some basic features like enabling certain stuff and working on the same object that simply don't work in the 2D engine at the current time. Enabling certain stuff. Yeah, so there's basically some kind of scripting support that is in the 3D engine, but it's not in the 2D engine. Uh, like what? No, simply like enabling the engine to uh, accept the rigid body. Okay. <laughs> do you have do you have like a example project that you can yeah. email me? Right. Yeah, I can. I send can it, send it. send me the example project. I yeah. need to kind of see it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, we're being kicked out. So um, thank you. We have a Unity booth, so you can have lots of uh, sweatbands and uh, fake tattoos, so you can convince all your parents you went away to a conference and got real tattoos. Um, I did that to my mum, and uh, yeah, she wasn't happy. Um, yeah, I'll be at the booth for most of the day, and uh, come say hi. Uh, there's also Anders, a lovely HR guy. You're recruiting. We're recruiting. Talk to him. He's got the gnarly beard. Uh, yeah, he might be an audio guy. And uh, we also have Alex McCready, who's an account guy who basically looks after developers here. And he's the nicest man in the world. But don't play him at Hearthstone, because he's ruthless. Um, cool. Thank you. <laughs>